All right, let's get started. Can anyone hear me? Yeah, okay, Mike's good. Okay, good. All right, so uh, welcome all to my talk about Schema Z, uh, a library that allows us to express types as values and from that values then construct all manner of fairly useful things. And obviously, the first technical difficulties. There we go. Right, so as a scenario for you to think about what is probably pretty convenient is just your regular JSON APIs, things that we write pretty much day in, day out. Um, you send messages that are serialized to JSON, you receive them, and we all have dealt with that probably. And one thing that you always have to come up with are encoders and decoders. And what they are really fundamentally are, are type class instances where an encoder of A is a function that takes some of your domain types or some of your domain type and transforms it to JSON. Uh, in this talk, JSON is just gonna be a string for simplicity's sake. And vice versa, a decoder is that the thing that takes your JSON and gives you back uh, your A. And um, there are tons of ways we can get to these encoders, right? We can hand roll them, which perhaps mostly nobody does anymore, or we use one of the various techniques and tools um, to do that. And Schema Z is also one of those, but also slightly more. So about these general solutions, um, if you're doing JSON, most likely you're using some library that is specialized in its use case uh, to JSON, like Circe, and you use its mechanism uh, to get encoders and decoders directly from the specification of your ADT in your Scala code. Or if you're a bit more adventurous or maybe have a non-standard use case, you will be using things like Shapeless or Magnolia to do type class derivation to construct basically that mechanism that uh, libraries like Circe already have, construct that yourself. There are a couple issues with this kind of compile time derivation, and you might have heard people already ranting about those, but especially if you have a API that lives very long, you will end up changing the state of types. You're gonna be refactoring things, and especially refactors are tricky because, I mean, a refactor of a name somewhere of a field, somewhere of an ADT, is supposed to be pretty innocent, but it's gonna break your API if you do compile time derivation because those mechanisms normally pull out the field names that are gonna be used in your JSON encoders directly from the source code from the ADT, right? And I mean, there are naive solutions around that and the most naive I could think of is you take your ADT, you copy paste it, and then you're saying that's gonna be my external facing data type. You put a big comment on top saying, don't touch this, don't refactor it, or everything is gonna break. And then you have your actual internal type that you use, you can refactor, you can do whatever, and then you just use a function from one to the other. And that's good and nice, it fixes like this one problem, uh, but we just reintroduce boilerplate after we use the mechanism to eliminate it. So it's kind of, it's not a satisfactory solution at all. I would, I would actually hesitate to call it a solution. So schema Z, um, making these things a value, giving you this notion of schema, allows you to operate on that value and decouples things like your actual source code and like this, ADT definitions you have there from the things that then happen in terms of, of type class derivation. So where do we fit in, just in terms of like the libraries that you might need or you might already know and use? And I put them in three categories here. Um, the top, yes, the top uh, one is things like Scala C deriving, like Shapeless, like Magnolia, that kind of give you the tools to handle all these mechanisms you own, but these are all like macro-based or uh, compile time de derivation style libraries. The second ones are um, use case specific, I would call them, things that particularly address one need, and they are 
more or less flexible depending on what you're doing and which library you're using. And the third one, and that's kind of the style of libraries that uh, Schema C fits in the best perhaps, is the style of libraries that intrinsically talks about the structure of your data. And um, Xenomorph and Skewmorph are probably the two that are most well known in terms of uh, the Scala ecosystem. Right, and we aren't the first ones to come up with the ideas uh, that we use, not, not by far. Um, many of the issues that we encountered have been addressed and in one way or another solved by one of these uh, libraries in one of these three categories. And at this point, I would also definitely like to thank all the maintainers of these libraries because uh, without their pioneering work, uh, we would have no clue how to build most of that stuff. Right, so the, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be mainly focusing on a set of cool techniques that we employ to build Scala, Scala, C, uh, Scala schema, schema. And uh, I'm gonna do this in kind of rounds, iterations. The first one is gonna be a initial draft where we're gonna come up with like the core technique, how we're gonna do this. And we're gonna find a couple issues in there. And then one by one, we're gonna eliminate those and arrive actually at a encoding that is fairly close to the one we are using right now. And I believe that is a good approach because somebody much smarter than I am has already said so. Right, so what is a schema? Like a bit more tangible. It is supposed to be a data structure which allows me to type safely capture the structure of some other ADT T. And then I should be able to write functions that take a schema that describes some t and write a function that then generates some f of t, right? And that f of t can be anything. JSON encoder is gonna be the example that I'm gonna use here, but it can be show instances, it can be Scala check gen instances, it can actually maybe be parsers, maybe? We don't know yet. Um, and this, Schema data type should fundamentally form the core of uh, the library and surrounding we should have a set of modules which are pick and choose for the end user that adds functionality and capability. And unsurprisingly, the schema itself is also an ADT. And this is gonna be our very first step here. And the schema F our schema data type has one type uh, parameter, A, which is this other ADT we want to describe. And as a example, this is kind of the style of ADTs we're talking about, right? So this is not just a trivial ADT, it actually has two cases, it has three primitives, it has recursion. Um, so it kind of touches on all the points that are somewhat common in day-to-day -day usage of ADTs. And this is the style of functions we want to be able to write. We want to write a function that takes a schema for whatever type A and returns an encoder of that very same type. If you squint a bit, that kind of looks like a natural transformation. That is because it is. Um, so if you are familiar with natural transformations, I encourage you to think in terms of those because um, it makes a whole bunch of sense. Right, the first thing that we have to do is capture primitives uh, because they are gonna be our terminal cases uh, for all our derivations. And we do this by introducing yet another ADT that allows us to capture types as values. And this is kind of like the first time we do this. And we do this by having this myprim trait, which has a type parameter A, and then having three case objects, which are values, that extend myprim with one specific type. And we'll see how, how this is gonna be uh, useful later on. And then we can do an appropriate case for our schema where we're saying, all right, we have a prim schema that takes some myprim, and that makes it a schema of whatever the A is that you pass using this myprim, right? Um, but that's not very flexible at all. So we actually just 
put in a type constructor, right? Because uh, we don't want to specify in the core what the set of primitives are that you want to work with, right? If you're working with JSON, your primitives are going to look different than if you're working with Avro or whatever. And this is going to be a, somewhat of a reoccurring theme. Um, there are going to be many, many, many more type parameters at the end of this talk. Right, so to go one step back, and we are just going to look at my prims here, so this one specific set of primitives, and we are going to think, all right, how can we get to an encoder of this my prims? And what we are using here is a bit of, of smart scala, and we are saying basically, all right, we are getting some my prim for an A, and this A looks like it's universally quantified, but it actually isn't, because we have only three different my prims, and each of these my prims fixes the A. So we pattern match on the my prim, we go to case int p, and in here, Scala is clever enough to realize that a has to be equal to int. And this is like the first technique that we are going to use throughout here to do all our further constructions. So for our to encoder function to stay somewhat general, um, because we have introduced this prim type constructor, we have to introduce a corresponding natural transformation because we don't know how you, what you want to do with your primitives. They're primitive. We can't construct anything with them. So this is a piece of information that we need to be supplied. And then to get to the actual encoder, we just unwrap the contained prim and pass it in the natural transformation and carry on. Now, um, you can see we can already actually introduce our first notion of schema. They're not very interesting. They're just primitives, but we can. And we can appropriately already get to encoders of these primitives uh, by just wrapping our two prim encoder function into a natural transformation and then calling the things and it works. Now we get to the first composite case. So primitives alone are just not interesting. The two fundamental ways you construct more complicated data is by means of products and sums and they tend to be extremely symmetrical. So basically the idea here is you have a product case which has two sides, a left-hand side and a right-hand side, describing the both sides of the product. And then note here, this is the important bit, in the extents, you build up a tuple, respectively an either of uh, this A and B. And this allows us to already just instantiate arbitrarily nested schemas at that point. And the cool thing is how you exactly nest your terms doesn't actually matter because it turns out that both product and sums in, their, in terms of types are monoidal. So we have an associative property that we can use to then like wiggle around with those uh, terms as we need. And we'll see actually later when we get to how we really construct our schemas where the exact difference would be. So in terms of the to encoder function for the product case, we are saying, all right, we're getting a product. And then this X and Y are the left and right hand side term types. And you note that here, Scala's, the Scala compiler is, again, smart enough to realize that A is equal to the top tuple of X and Y. And then we can take the respective parts of the tuple call recursively the to encoder function with their appropriate schema, pass the thing in, put the comma in between because this is going to be fields in our objects, and we're done. And we can do the same with sums, except the difference is it's an either, so we just need to dispatch to the correct side. Now you'll note that with that you can actually uh, get to invalid JSON, which is not so good, and this is one of the first points here that then we're going to correct in uh, a successive round. Right, wrapping schemas. So the point here is we can talk about like the bare bone structures of our ADTs already, but we can't talk in terms of case clauses or sealed trait hierarchies yet. For this, we need wrapping schemas. And there's three of them. Um, the, right now, they look like structurally identical that will change down the lane. Um, but the whole idea here is that for a record, which is the schema we use to represent case classes, you would have a base schema of some nested product, right? So if you have a person case class with like name and age and maybe is active flag, your base schema 
OPS schema that captures a tuple of string int boolean. And then you have an isomorphism between this uh, nested tuple and the case class you want to express, yielding you a schema of whatever you're, you're mapping to with that isomorphism. And it's the exact same idea for union, except you're going to have nested eaters. And the, for the iso case, we'll get later to why we need that one. And we are going to use this distinction actually later to make our JSON valid again. So that's why it's there. Their respective two encoder function parts is also just the same right now. What you're doing here is you want to encode an A, but you have a B. But we have an ISO of that, so we get the encoder for the underlying B, which is perhaps some sort of tuple. And then we use the reverse get side of the ISO to get from our case class to the tuple, stick it in, and we have our result. Now, the interesting observation here is that we're using reverse get, and that is because we are getting, or right now, deriving encoders, and encoders turn out to be contravariant functors, which is why we need to use that side of the isomorphism. But the last kind of piece, or nearly the last piece that is missing, is uh, fields and branches things that we can put names on. And the whole idea here is you have two, two entries in this ADT that just tag a underlying schema with some name. And again, you're seeing we're introducing more type parameters. Uh, the whole idea here is that you aren't supposed to be forced to always identify your fields with strings, right? Maybe you're using a data format that indexes its fields, so you might want to use integer. Maybe you want to be extra fancy and use refined types to make sure that all your names are camel cased or whatever. Um, but because at the end of the day, we need to actually get to our JSON representation, which is string, we need to know how we need to translate uh, these two things. So we just stick two functions in here that the user is supposed to pass us. And um, their two encoder parts are fairly boring. Basically, you just do the appropriate JSON notation uh, for fields. It's just a object property. And for branches, which is a field for unions. So with fields, you capture fields in case classes. With branches, you capture cases of your sealed trait hierarchy. And here we just do a JSON object with with one property and that property name uh, dispatches on your case class name. One of the kind of pretty useful cases is lists. Uh, this is super simple. And all you need to do is you have this element schema, because we have homogeneous lists. We only need to describe one element. Um, that can be anything. And then here in the extents, once again, we're just saying, all right, it's now a list of A. And in the appropriate to encoder part, you will see now here that we actually need to encode a list of A's, and we just map over the list, recursively called the to encoder. This is not particularly op optimal way to do this, but whatever. And then we do make string and put this in square brackets so we have JSON again. Recursion is the last kind of fundamental thing that is fairly important. And here, it's really just all about staying lazy. And we do that by taking a schema and just put it in a thunk for later usage. And in your recursion part, you have to be super careful when you write these style of functions, because you have to make sure that this is constructed lazily, which thankfully this is already is, because we're returning actually a function. But if you're doing, for instance, Scala check gen instances, you have to make sure that you use the gen.delay constructor, because else, as soon as this two encoder gets called, you're just going to spin in, in cycles and eventually end up with a stack overflow. Right, so uh, that's that. Um, that's our like first naive implementation of schema C, except it has a couple issues, right? So we have no options, for instance, or any other uh, constructions. That's the one we, we have fixed in our ADT. There is already way too many type parameters. and. We are not yet done with that. Uh, we can generate invalid JSON, which is not good. And um, it's like 99% recursion when you're writing this, this, this functions. So that's also kind of um, not so nice to work with. So round two is going to be a short one. 
And here we're gonna be tackling options. And if you have been at any of the workshops lately here at this conference, or have heard the word isomorphism before, uh, I am not gonna tell you much new now. And the idea here is that an option of A is the same as an either of unit and A. And what we introduced actually is this unit schema, this one schema. In the JSON case, this just maps to null. Right, so this is kind of your thing, your, un, your, your type with one inhabitant uh, that corresponds to null, to the null thing in JSON, right? And then we, are, we got to use this third type of wrapping schema, the ISO schema. The whole idea of the ISO schema is it is literally that, a isomorphism between two things. So we write a function which gets some schema of A and it returns a schema of option of A. And we use a sum with one and that schema, which gives us a schema of either unit and A, and then an ISO schema with an isom isomorphism that proves that either unit A and option A are indeed the same thing. Um, you can do that with whatever, right? So if you need like vectors and you wanna do lists to vectors or all these things, you can introduce these schemas without having to put them on the ADT explicitly. With modules, we wanted to do two things. One, um, alleviate this type parameter mess that we already have. And secondly, clean up syntax. And for that, we need to think about our type parameters a bit more. So it turns out within one schema tree, because that's what it kinda is, uh, you have a couple type parameters that stay always constant. They never change within one tree, right? Your selection of primitives has to stay the same, and so have your identifier. So we put that just in a trait to capture that, and then we introduced a schema module which is co-located with the ADT in the core of the library uh, that accepts such a realization. And then somewhere down the line, you have to actually supply an instance of that. But in the meantime, we now can clean up the types by just basically already putting all the, the primitives and, and some terms, product terms, already in where they belong. So you actually have types where you can talk about the thing that you care about, which is the types they describe and not much else. Then syntax-wise, we put up a whole bunch of constructors uh, for two reasons. For one, these all return properly schemas instead of the subtype. Uh, which can sometimes happen if you do this kind of constructions and that tends to mess things up. Uh, so we have taken care of that. And the other thing is that, uh, surprise, surprise, when we tackle recursion, we do that with recursion schemes. Um, so this is where we're gonna do all the fixed point stuff. What we also have is a fairly convenient syntax, um, just because we like infix arrows and infix operators that allow you to construct schemas, right? So colon times colon to construct up product schemas, uh, colon plus colon for some schemas and the respective arrows to do fields and branches. Now, if you were to start to decide, all right, what, what do I actually wanna work with? You would write some realization like this. And here, this is where you have to decide, well, okay, what do I call things and what is my set of primitives, right? So this also actually, um, decides for you what the natural transformation that you have to supply to the two encoder looks like, right? Now, the two encoder function would then go on some JSON module, which again is a trait, which extends the core module with an R because you still don't actually have to decide here what your set is. The user can decide still further down the lane. And this is where your two encoder goes, and you'll see here that we already dropped pretty much most of the type parameters here because we have this R instance uh, contained in schema module where we can pull the types out. And then at the end, you, if you want to actually have a thing with which you can construct schemas and get this two encoder function and everything, you would create some module, you would supply this abstract instance, you would supply the appropriate type parameter, and then you have the whole thing, right? Now with that, you can actually uh, then construct, construct schemas. And that's what we're gonna do next. So this was the ADT we wanted to construct, just so uh, you have it all present again, uh, with this seal trait, two case clauses, we have recursion here, and our three different primitives. <laughs> 
and this is what it looks like. Um, so it's basically, this is the schema for subordinate, this is the schema for boss, and this is the schema for the sealed trade. And you'll note that they kind of look the same, and that is because products and sums are dual to each other, right? So we have here, we have this infix operator, so this builds up a schema, a tuple schema, and here we have the isomorphism mapping between this tuple and the case class. And this is also where the associativity thing comes in, right? You can write an isomorphism for any placement of the brackets. So it really doesn't matter. And the union here uh, looks pretty much the same, except you have pluses everywhere, and here you have to deal with eaters. Now, uh, let's actually make sure we get to valid JSON at some point. Um, and if you think a bit more about the problem, we have kind of two problems. We have rules about the structure of our schema that we want to enforce on two different levels. On one hand side, we have global rules, like all unions have to be a sum of branches, and all records have to be a product of fields. But on the other hand, you might have things that are more module specific, like in a JSON module, you probably don't want anonymous tuples because if you start encoding them, you won't have any field names. Or you also probably don't want any top level fields or top level branches because that's also just going to yield you not valid JSON. And our current solution approach to that is uh, phantom types. So we introduce another type um, parameter in schema F. And then we basically build up a type which represents the schema that you're building. And then we can use implicits and type class constraints to make sure that your schema is structurally sound. And this, this type constructors, they look something like this. So you will see that basically for all our data constructors, we have a corresponding type here. And they don't have any right-hand side. So they're, they don't actually exist, really. They're just there for compile time's sake. And here, it's the right-hand side that we care about. We have this new R parameter, and then we have the representation type. That's what we call it, because it kind of represents your schema at the type level that gets built up. So for the sum case, you still have the A and B um, of your left and right-hand side, but you also have the structural type, this representation type of the left and right-hand side. So if we look at an example, the boss schema, uh, this would get you something like this, right? So it's a record overall. It's a record that whose base schema describes a tuple of string and boolean, maps to boss. Its representation type of the base is a product whose left-hand side is a field, whose right-hand side is a field, and uh, they are identified by strings, and they express a string and a boolean respectively. Now we can actually put type class constraints on these representation types. And um, the appropriate trait for this and derivation would look something like this, right? And these are the three rules we're interested in. So to have a valid record, your underlying field, uh, your underlying schema has to be either a field, right? This is this one, or it has to be a product whose left-hand side and right-hand side is a record, or it is isomorphic to something that itself is a record. And that gives us this uh, structural assurance that in a record we actually really only have um, product of fields. And you can use these mechanisms to pretty much um, encode arbitrary properties for whatever you want of your schema uh, on the global level or within the modules. So you have that flexibility. Now, final round. Um, this is recursion going to be, right? And uh, as I already mentioned, uh, we do this with recursion schemes. Now, this is not going to be a talk for the remainder about recursion schemes, so I'm not going to go too deep about the mechanisms here. But uh, the TLDR version of it is with recursion schemes, we don't have to care about recursing manually, and we can um, do a separation of concern between how we fold our data structure and what we want to do during that fold, right? Because if you think about this function to encoder, what we are effectively doing is we're traversing down this tree to our terminal cases, applying some transformation, going one step up and combining all our results up, which is like a fold, 
but we, we are kind of forced to do the folding ourselves as well as the transformation, which is what we want to get away from. Uh, if you are familiar with Droste or Matryoshka or any of the other recursion schemes uh, libraries, you might not recognize a couple of the types, and this is because we have to do everything one kind higher, because we're actually working with um, natural transformations rather than functions. Right, and to get there, uh, we need to actually do th three things. Uh, for one last time, we have to introduce a new type parameter on our schema f. Um, we have to write interpreters, and interpreters is, are the data structure that capture different folds, basically. And we have to add some new syntax, so it's nice and simple to use. So, first step, introduce our new type parameter. And then, in every non-terminal case, uh, we are replacing um, our recursive schema references with this, with this type constructor. Um, if you're familiar with recursion schemes, this is where the whole fixed point uh, stuff would go into. The second thing that you need commonly for recursion schemes are functors, uh, except our functor looks a bit weird because it actually operates over binatural transformations because our f is of kind star to star to star. Right, the interpreters. So uh, I already mentioned that this is basically uh, just a wrapper around a specific fold. Um, this basically allows us then to later look these folds up implicitly. That's the whole idea. And uh, currently, this should be G. Um, currently, we are offering two style of folds. We're uh, offering the kind of just easy catamorphism. Uh, which is the style of folds that we did uh, when writing our two encoder function, and uh, a hylomorphism, which is a unfold followed by a fold uh, with which you can do a bit more uh, complicated and intricate things. Right, so in our JSON module, this is what our final version of this two encoder would look like. Everything became implicit, and we'll see when we get to the syntax why. Uh, we still have this natural transformation, we still have our functions, here they are Liskov, um, but that doesn't really matter. And then we're returning some interpreter, and here specifically a kata interpreter. And the implementation changed to something looking like this. And really, it's still pretty much the exact same thing. Uh, we introduced a couple helper functions and things like that, but the really important part here is there is no more recursion going on. All we have to care about is actually constructing the thing we are interested in, rather than how does it mechanically work to recurse over the structure. And finally, we can um, um, fix up our syntax. And um, this is why everything is implicit, because we're looking for these interpreters implicitly. You'll note here that this uh, representation type is kind of ignored at that point, and that is because that thing is a phantom anyway, and after you have uh, like gone to your target, you don't care about it anymore. You can't really do anything useful anymore with it. So you get to an encoder by just saying to encoder, and that's that. And then it, it, it will look up the interpreter in the appropriate trait uh, that this module extends, pick up the interpreter, apply the interpreter, and you'll have your encoder, and everything works out nicely. Now, where do we want to go with this? Uh, because the whole thing is very heavily still work in progress. Uh, actually, this whole conference already led to me uh, doing a whole new like prototype for the core of it. <laughs> so uh, we're very actively hacking on that. But we already kind of know in what direction we want to go. And the first one is the obvious one, and that's just module support, right? So with this whole structure, the idea is that we can do a Cersei module, a JSON4S module, an Obro4S module, and give you interop and kind of like type class derivation for free for all the libraries that you like to use. And especially also for like a bit more uh, data engineering um, kind of data formats because that's why I kind of want this library. The other thing is migrations. Uh, I'm not gonna touch really further on that. Uh, watch Valentin's talk at Scala R where he talked about the concept of it or grab us just all somewhere in the hallway and ask us if you're interested about it. The gist is uh, if you have ever worked with Avro, they have this notion of compatibility forward and backward between schemas. We want to do that in a type safe way. Um, somehow. 
We already have a working version and we are uh, constantly refining it. The other thing, and this is really important for this project, is extensive documentation. And what we want to do is have kind of like a three tier system, like a tier one, which is just usage, right? How do you define schemas and uh, what module do you need and how do you get to whatever you want to go? The second one is for people that want to write their own modules. So there it would be like the basics of recursion schemes. How do you write these things? How do you wire them up? And how do you like make it nice and tidy? And the third level is uh, how does all the core things work? So kind of this presentation, but much more extended so that if somebody wants to start contributing on the, on the core, maybe, um, they have, would have a good place to start. And uh, last but not least, uh, thanks to my co-authors of this library, uh, also this project started uh, with John's Spartans program. Um, Valentin took the lead and I got back or got into this project a bit later. Uh, this is, by the way, how you recognize me online. I'm the weird anglerfish. Um, because I work as a data engineer and this is something I had to kind of do by hand day in, day out. And if I had a powerful enough library to do that for me, I could just kind of take off half the day. Right. And we have actually an official motto. Uh, we write really long types so you don't have to because believe me, these record types get about as long as your schema is. So that's that. Uh, yeah. And I think now we, yeah, we got the questions. None? No, that's fine as well.